I'm going to be talking today about uh, the life of Solomon and talking a little bit about the first couple of chapters of Ecclesiastes since that kind of gives you a real good flavor of what the book is all about. And so I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, Father, we just thank you again for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness, your compassion, your love, and your mercy. Without that, we're, where would we be, Father? Thank you that you reached out to us, Father, and you touched our hearts and drew us to yourself. Thank you again for this time. We pray that it bring you glory and that, uh, um, that the message really uh, strike a chord with, with all who are listening. David was one of Israel's greatest kings. During his reign between 1011 and 971 B.C., he unified the tribes of Israel, drove out invaders, conquered Jerusalem, and set the standard by which all kings that followed would be judged. He followed God all his days and was known as a man after God's own heart. Yet David was also a great sinner. After ascending the throne, he committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. Then, when he found out she was pregnant with his child, he conspired to have her husband, Uriah, killed in battle. David soon made Bathsheba his wife, and soon after their child was born, the baby became ill and died. Previously, Nathan the prophet had confronted David, and he admitted his guilt, repented, and was forgiven. After this, in 996 B.C., Bathsheba bore David a second son, whom, the, whom God named Jedidiah, meaning beloved of the Lord. David and Bathsheba, however, named him Solomon. The book of 1 Kings begins with the final years of David's reign. David is 70 years of age. The news of David's failing health soon prompted Adonijah, David's fourth son, to assert his claim to the throne. By this time, Adonijah's older brothers, Amnon and Absalom, and evidently Chiliab, were dead, making him the heir apparent. He soon gained the support of Joab, David's powerful general, and the high priest Abiathar. However, the prophet Nathan knew Adonijah was not God's choice to be the next king. That distinction would fall to Solomon. Nathan's intervention prompted David to formally recognize Solomon as his successor, even though he was not next in line for the kingship. Adonijah's support quickly eroded, and he begged Solomon for mercy. Solomon spared his life as long as he renounced his claim to the throne. Before dying, David admonished Solomon to obey the Mosaic law so he would have a successful kingship. Once the succession was secure, 20-year-old Solomon began his reign on a good footing. He asked God to give him wisdom to shepherd his people. And the Lord responded by giving him not only wisdom, but also great riches and power. And the, it begs the question, do we, how often do we ask God for wisdom and discernment? It's so important. And Solomon did the right thing by starting off that way. Solomon's kingdom would grow to be one of the most powerful in the world at the time. Israel, which had a population of about 4 million, experienced an era of peace and prosperity. Solomon took advantage of the decline in Egyptian and Assyrian power to expand the economic interests of his vast realm. One of his first political acts was to confirm the alliance that had existed between David, his father, and Hiram, king of Tyre. Tyre is in modern-day Lebanon and is located about 40 miles north northwest of Nazareth. Israel had never, known any, had never shown any desire to attack the powerful fortress of the Phoenician coast, and the ratification of a treaty of friendship with Hiram had the effect of placing the economic wealth and resources of the maritime kingdom at the disposal of Solomon 
without the effort and risk of a military campaign. Jewish merchants sailed on Phoenician ships throughout the Mediterranean Sea and established trading posts in North Africa, Greece, Turkey, Italy, and Spain. The domestication of the camel as a beast of burden had revolutionized the caravan trade throughout the Near East, making it possible to transport much heavier loads over longer distances. Since Solomon controlled the frontier districts of Transjordan, he acquired an actual monopoly of the entire caravan trade between Arabia, Syria, India, and Africa. From this vibrant commercial activity, Solomon derived a great deal of revenue, partly by exacting tolls and partly by engaging in trade with other nations. He built a large navy, which was based at Ezion Geber on the Gulf of Aqaba, which was, the northern, which was in, located in the northern part of the Red Sea and was manned by Phoenician sailors. These ships carried the products of Israel to the ports of the east and west and brought back gold, silver, copper, and other luxury commodities. That's found in 1 Kings 10.22. Solomon's first mistake was forming a marriage alliance with Pharaoh and taking his daughter as his wife. God had, forbid, had forbidden the Jewish people from marrying anyone from the surrounding pagan trial, tribes and foreigners as well. Perhaps the best and most memorable display of Solomon's wisdom is seen in 1 Kings 3, verses 16 to 28. Then two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, Oh, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. It happened on the third day after I gave birth that this woman also gave birth to a child, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, only the two of us in the house. This woman's son died in the night because she lay on it. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead son in my bosom. When I arose in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. But when I looked carefully at him in the morning, behold, he was not my son, whom I had born. Then the other woman said, No, for the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. But the first woman said, No, for the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, the one said, this is my son who is living, and your son is dead, is the dead one. And the other one says, no, for your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. King Solomon then said, get me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the child in two, and give half to one, and half to the other. Then the woman whose child was the living one spoke to the king, for she was deeply stirred over her son, and said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other one said, He shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king said, Give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Significantly, the essence of wisdom is revealed in Solomon's handling of this difficult case, having no witnesses. The king had insight into basic human nature, in this case, maternal instincts, that enabled him to understand why people behave as they do and how they will respond in various situations. Solomon's wisdom in this case became known throughout his kingdom and beyond, so that he was admired as a wise administrator of justice. We should do well to imitate Solomon's request for wisdom and discernment. James 1.5 states, But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. 
when the Bible speaks of wisdom, it is not talking about a person's intelligence. From God's perspective, wisdom is a moral quality. A wise person gives life skillfully, lives life skillfully because he has discernment and can distinguish between good and evil. Wisdom is seen in having the mind of Christ. When a person is wise, he sees a situation as Christ would see it. Wisdom comes only from God, and it is a gift he gives to those who ask for it. The word of God contains the words of life, and they are a treasure beyond anything the world has to offer. God gave Solomon a unique type of wisdom and insight. This amazing understanding would enable him to write the bulk of what is known as the wisdom literature, including the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Unfortunately, Solomon laid a trap for himself early in his kingship by mixing pagan practices into his worship and sacrificing to the Lord on the hilltops where the Canaanites had formerly worshipped the false god Baal. During the course of his lifetime, Solomon's love for the Lord would grow lukewarm. In contrast, David's love for God grew stronger and deeper the longer he walked in obedience. The difference is that David repented of his sinful behavior. You can check that out in Psalm 51. While Solomon continued to excuse his shortcomings, for all his wisdom, Solomon would not prove to be faithful to God. The application for us is that when we obey God, we give him the opportunity to demonstrate his faithfulness, power, and love in our lives. We gain a deeper understanding of his character as we walk in obedience, and this leads us to have a deeper love for him. However, as we see in 1 Kings chapter 4 to 11, the opposite is also true. If we persist in ignoring his word, our hearts will grow cold toward God. And that is something we should do well to keep in mind. 1 Kings chapter 4, Solomon began his reign armed with God's wisdom and his blessings for wealth and honor. As he set up his government, he was careful to choose men who were loyal to him and who had served his father David faithfully during his reign. Solomon also chose men who were skilled in areas necessary to the functioning of a strong government, including priests, record keepers, and administrators. Solomon appointed 12 district governors and assigned each a month of the year to supply the king's household with provisions and food. The people of Israel as well had enough to eat and drink, and they were happy, enjoying the basic comforts of life. Whereas David had refused to employ chariots, Solomon saw their value as a military weapon, and he built up a number of divisions that were stationed in strategic positions throughout his kingdom. These fortified towns included Jerusalem, Gezer, located 30 miles to the west of Jerusalem, close to the Mediterranean coast, Hazor, located about 15 miles north, northwest of the Sea of Galilee, and Megiddo, on the Mediterranean coast, near what would be Caesarea. Archaeological excavations at these sites have uncovered the remains of, the char of chariot enclosures and stables. The estimated 12,000 horses and 1,400 chariots used for national defense served as a strong deterrent to potential foreign aggressors. 1 Kings chapter 5, the most spectacular of the public works Solomon undertook were to be found in Jerusalem. After Solomon repaired the damage done to the city walls, the stage was set for him to begin the task of building the temple. In 1 Chronicles 22, 5 to 10, David had begun gathering many materials needed to build the temple, included, including stones, timber, and iron. Because David had shed so much blood, the Lord forbade him from building his house and left the project to his successor. In order for Solomon to build this magnificent structure, he called on an old ally of his father, Hiram, king of Tyre, Tyre, to obtain the necessary lumber for the construction. Many of them came from the cedars, those famous cedars from Lebanon. 
The temple would serve to remind the king and his people of the serious state of their sin and God's forgiveness and grace. It was to be the center of their worship of the one true God and a place of prayer and reading of his word. Along with the activities of worship, the very structure of the temple was intended to prepare people to recognize the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah who would take away the sin of the world. 966 B.C., as Solomon began building the temple, the Lord spoke to him in 1 Kings 6, 11, 13. You can find this conversation. Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, quote, Concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments, and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. However, the Lord warned Solomon and Israel that only their continued obedience and not the temple would guarantee his continued presence. So make no mistake about it. Obedience is so important. Christ said, if you obey me, if you love me, you will obey me. Solomon spared no excuse in building and furnishing the temple. He had much of the interior of the structure overlaid with pure gold. From foundation to finishing, it took Solomon seven years and six months to build the temple. And it was finally completed in 959 B.C. The time finally arrived 11 months later for the dedication of the temple. As the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the most holy place, the cloud of God's presence descends and fills the place. Solomon concludes the dedication ceremony by blessing the assembly and offering the first sacrifice in the temple. Chapter 9. God appeared to Solomon a second time to tell the king his prayers have been heard. But this visit comes with a stern warning as found in chapter 9. Verses 4 to 9 of 1 Kings. Quote, if, now if you walk before me as your father walked, in integrity of heart and uprightness, doing, all, accord, doing according to all that I have commanded you and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom of Israel forever. Just as I promised to your father David, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons indeed turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have constructed for my name, the temple. I will cast out of my sight. So Israel will become a proverb and a byword among the peoples, and this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone who passes by will be astonished and hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And they will say, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and adopted other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this adversity on them. By the way, the destruction of the temple and exile from the land were predicted by Moses in Deuteronomy 29, verses 24 to 28. Beginning toward the end of Solomon's reign, and and including most of the kings that followed, both in the kingdoms of Judah and in Israel, rampant idolatry and wickedness, became commonplace. The destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC graphically demonstrated the Lord's anger both against Judah and Israel. Chapter 10. Solomon began his reign on a high note. He loved the Lord and walked according to his statutes just as his father David had done. And the Lord blessed him mightily. However, Solomon continued to offer sacrifices in the high places where the pagan Canaanites had worshipped their false gods in the past. 
this act of disobedience laid the foundation for future acts of rule breaking, which ultimately led to Solomon's downfall. The root of Solomon's problem was his marriages. Solomon acquired 700 wives and 300 concubines, many of whom were from surrounding pagan tribes and foreign nations. The Lord had expressly forbidden these relationships because they would inevitably lead to idolatry. This same principle and warning applies to Christians today. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 states, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? So this applies not only to marriage. Think about this, but it also applies to business relationships as well. Some Christians excuse romantic involvement with non-Christians with the argument that they will hopefully lead the other person to the Lord. But here God warned that it does not work that way. When a Christian is unequally yoked with a non-Christian, the Christian's walk with the Lord generally will suffer. Unfortunately, Solomon loved his wives too much, and those wives led him away from the Lord's prescribed worship. Solomon had now become an open idolater, worshiping images of wood and stone in the sight of the temple. As one of my friends would say, how stupid is that? Chapter 11, 9 to 11. So the Lord became angry with Solomon, especially because he had, previously, he had been previously warned twice. Verses 11 and 12. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and not kept my covenant, co covenant and my statutes which I commanded you I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant nevertheless I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David I will tear it out of the hand of your son who happened to be real bomb soon Solomon not only had to deal with external threats from neighboring tribes but also with an internal crisis when Jeroboam a trusted servant rebelled against him. Verse 40. Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam, but he rose and fled to Egypt and remained there until the death of Solomon. 1 Kings 11, 42 and 43. And the period that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem was 40 years. Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. And just as he had promised, the Lord divided the kingdom in two. Judah in the south with two tribes, with one tribe, and Israel in the north with 11 tribes. Lessons from the life of Solomon. Number one, Christians should not marry non-Christians. That's non-negotiable. Number two, God calls his people to complete obedience. That's not negotiable either. Number three, the Lord does not tolerate syncretism, which means combining elements of diverse religious and worldly philosophies, principles, and ideas into worship with the word of God. That's happened over the centuries because the Bible was, not, was forbidden and people didn't have it in their hands to check things out. And so things crept in. So be very careful. That's why it's good to be a Berean and check everything with the scriptures. Whatever anybody says, including me or anybody else that stands here in this pulpit, check it with the scriptures to make sure it is correct. And now we're going to switch to the first couple of chapters of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon. There are 12 chapters in all, but I'm just going to cover two because it gives you a good, strong flavor of what's going on. 1 Kings 11.43 informed us that Solomon died. All the succeeding kings of Judah and Israel also died. If we go all the way back to what has been referred to as the worst chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, we find that Adam and Eve were deceived by a serpent, disobeyed God, and ate of the forbidden fruit. As a result, the result was pain in childbearing, hard labor in weed-infested fields, disease, aging, and death. The perfect and beautiful life in paradise vanished, as the first couple were banished from the presence of God for their rebellious sin. 
After all, God cannot coexist with sin. And so they were set off. So now we have to deal with the consequences of that original sin. As one person poignantly put it, the days are long, the years are short, then we die. We need to face the hard reality that we are all going to die. David Gibson, pastor of Trinity Church in Aberdeen, Scotland, and author of the, of the 2017 book, Living Life Backwards, how Ecclesiastes teaches us to live in light of the end, states, states in the book's preface, I am convinced that only a proper perspective on death provides the true perspective on life. Living in light of your death will help you to live wisely and freely and generously. The chapters of Gibson's book consists of reflections on that strangest of Old Testament books, which is Ecclesiastes. Gibson continues, Ecclesiastes teaches us to live life backward. It encourages us to take the one thing in the future that is certain, our death, and work backward from that point to all the details and decisions and heartaches of our lives and to think about them from the perspective of the end. It is the destination, it is the destination that makes sense of the journey. If we know for sure where we are heading, then we can know for sure what we need to do before we get there. Ecclesiastes invites us to let the end sculpt our priorities and goals, our greatest ambitions and our strongest desires. I want to persuade you that only if you prepare to die can you really learn how to live. By the way, this was a book that my son gave to me over two years ago in the spring of 2019. And when I started reading it, I couldn't put it down. And I was inspired to do something like I wanted to preach from this thing. And so I, I tried that, but uh, it didn't happen back then until now. I did preach on it in South Africa. So I was happy about that uh, two years ago. But uh, I, I'm, I was very impressed with this book. Um, it had a real impact in my life. The English title Ecclesiastes comes from the Greek and Latin translations of Solomon's book. The Greek term Ecclesiastes with two Ks means preacher and is derived from the word Ecclesia, translated assembly or congregation in the New Testament. That's where we get Iglesia in Spanish. Solomon's declaration that all is vanity is one of the most prominent themes of the book of Ecclesiastes. The word translated vanity is used in at least three ways throughout this book. In each case, it looks at the nature of man's activity under the sun. As number one, this is one of the first ways it's used, that it means fleeting. Vanity means fleeting which has in view the vapor-like or transitory nature of life. James 4.14 underscores this view by stating, quote, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a while and then vanishes away. The second way vanity is used points to futility or meaningless which focuses on the cursed condition of the universe and the debilitating effects it has on man's earthly experience. And finally, the third way vanity is used carries the idea of incomprehensible or enigmatic, in other words, puzzling or inexplicable, which gives consideration to life's unanswerable questions. Solomon draws upon all three meanings in Ecclesiastes. While the content in each case will determine which meaning Solomon is focusing upon, the most reoccurring meaning of vanity is incomprehensible or unknowable, referring to the mysteries of God's purposes. Ecclesiastes contains the words of, quote, the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, 
And Solomon begins by shocking his readers. The very first thing he wants to tell us in verse 2 of chapter 1 in Ecclesiastes is that all is vanity, vanity of vanities. Vanity of vanities is Solomon's way of saying the greatest vanity, the biggest vanity of all. It's used for emphasis. The bold statement gets our attention from the start. This is nothing less than a shocking reality check. What does it mean to say everything is vanity? Many Bible scholars have translated the Hebrew word hebel, H-E-B-E-L, as meaningless in this context. In fact, hebel is also accurately translated as breath or breeze. Solomon is stating that everything is a mist, a vapor, a puff of wind, a bit of smoke that appears and quickly disappears. It is a common biblical idea. Psalm 39, 4 to 6 and 11, a psalm of David states, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath, Hebel. Surely man goes about as a shadow. For surely for nothing, Hebel, nothing, Hebel, they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather, who will inherit it. Ecclesiastes 2, 18 to 20, mirrors the same thought. Verse 11, when you discipline a man uh, with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is near dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Hebel. Psalm 144, verses 3 and 4, a psalm of David states, Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, Hebel. His days are like a passing shadow. Both David and Solomon compare life to a mere breath. How long does it take to breathe in and out? The preacher is reminding us that life is short. It is transient, temporary, and vanishes quickly. It comes and goes without a permanent impact or lasting impression on the world. We are born, we live, we die, and it happens so quickly. So quickly. The book of Ecclesiastes is a meditation on what it means for our lives to be like a whisper spoken in the wind, here one minute and carried away forever than the next. The days are long, but the years are short, then you die. If we try to gain control of the world and our lives by what we can understand and by what we can do, we find that the control we seek eludes us. Or consider what we do with our lives. We can pour our whole life into something and it might succeed or it might fail. How much control do you really have over whether your job is secure? or how healthy you will be, or what you will be doing in 10 years' time. I'm sure many of us have gone to the beach and attempted to build or help a child build a sandcastle. Using a plastic pail and shovel, we did our best to create a decent-looking sand structure, even setting up a few others around it to fortify it. After putting all the finishing touches on it, we take a good look at our lovely creation with a certain amount of pride and accomplishment. But within a day, the tide rises and quickly dissolves everything we had worked so diligently to construct. Young and old quickly realize that sandcastles do not last. We also realize that we don't have much control over the outcome either. And that is precisely what our lives are like. Psalm 103, 15 to 16, also a psalm of David states, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in, of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. These illustrations hit home. 
When we consider the brevity of our lives set against the millennia of the earth, we know that what Solomon wrote is so true. While we pretend we're in control and that what we do will make a difference in the world, the words of Ecclesiastes bluntly confronts us with a stark reality. The preacher begins the process with a question, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? This question is key to the opening section of the book. Everything that follows in verses 4 to 11 is intended as the answer. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place, it rises there again. Blowing toward the south, then blowing toward the north, the wind continues swirling around and along, and on its circular courses the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, they flow again. All things are wearisome, wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be, and what has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see, this, this is new? Already it has existed for ages, which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things, and also of the latter things which will occur. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. The implied answer to the question in verse 3 is nothing. From a life full of labor, heartaches, and toil under the sun, people gain absolutely nothing. Nothing. The only thing we leave behind is the earth we used to live on. Ecclesiastes 1, verses 4 to 10. Everything either goes around and around or comes and goes. It rises and sets. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. What is present will soon be past. Everything is cyclical rather than linear. Solomon is pointing out that life is repetitive. The most important words in the book of Ecclesiastes is found in verse 9. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Solomon's aim here is to remind us that at the end of the day, human beings gain nothing from all their toil under their sun, under the sun. We gain nothing from working as hard as we can because the world will go on regardless of what's been done. And the world will not remember you anyway. Isn't that just cheerful? It will not even remember the children we have or will one day have. Solomon's point is that people do not gain from their labor or toil because ultimately they are going to die and be forgotten. That includes all of us here, including me. This side of eternity, life is a breath, hebel. It may not make perfect sense to us yet, but Solomon is carefully laying the foundation for the main argument of his book. Only preparing to die will teach us how to live. The single question that motivates Solomon is this. If we won't live forever or even long enough to make a lasting difference to the world, how then should we live? Hint, it will take the rest of Ecclesiastes to answer that question. To begin with, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, makes a very basic point clear. Accepting death is the first step to learning to live. We are not God, and we should never believe that we are in control. We are not. We cannot make permanent what has not been meant to be permanent. Life has a repetitiveness built into it which, can, which we are not meant to try to escape. What is new is not really new, and what feels new will soon feel old. 
As we search for something new under the sun, so we are searching for novelty, for change, for a fresh new experience, and it does not exist. Whatever you think you've gained, it will soon vanish from the earth like morning mist, and you and me along with it too. There's a, a saying in Spanish that my wife and I repeat to ourselves and we teach our kids. Todo se acaba. Everything comes to an end. Todo se acaba. Look at Sears. He was, a, he was there for years, for a century, more. But it's gone. Todo se acaba. Everything has a beginning and everything has an end. Todo se acaba. Everything must vanish, disappear, end. One day you and I will be dead and gone, and the world will go on, probably without even remembering you or I. A hundred years after your death or mine, the chances are no one will ever know you or I lived. I taught history, by the way, and my students, uh, just less than 20 years ago, didn't even know what the Vietnam War was didn't even know anything about that war. And that was like within my lifetime. I was young and I had a low draft number and I could have gone over there and gotten killed. But yet today nobody remembers. In Ecclesiastes 1, 12, all the way to Ecclesiastes 2, verse 26, we read all about the works and pleasures Solomon pursued that would make him happy. More wisdom, wine, women, entertainment, Vast building projects, amassing great wealth, power, and prestige. Society today is no different from what Solomon thought would make him happy. The continuing reality is that what we today long for and live for is whatever makes us happy, both on the surface and at the deepest levels of our lives. In all our varied pursuits, earning a living, finding a spouse, raising good children, seeking fun and entertainment, keeping healthy and fit, we exhibit a common desire to be happy in what we do. We, we do not simply exist. We attempt to control, shape, and change our circumstances and the world. We plan and dream about our individual lives and those dear to us. We live with a purpose and we have a goal to be happy. The Declaration of Independence uh, Thomas Jefferson says, uh, pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. We're all trying to chase the same thing and to be happy. And Solomon did the same. He set out to explore, quote, all that is done under heaven. Verse 113. In, verse, in chapter 2, verse 3, he tells us that what he wanted to see was what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few years of their lives. End of quote. As Solomon experienced all pleasures, projects, and possessions, he held happiness in his hands and then helplessly felt it slip through his fingers like water and vanishing down the drain forever. Solomon discovered that he could not make the world different from how it actually is. That's chapter 1, verse 15. And the preacher, after all his projects, possessions, and pleasures have run their course, realized he's left with only sandcastles on the beach. Quickly and predictably vanishing. Chapter 2, verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind. And there is nothing to be gained under the sun. In verses 13 to 17, Solomon compared the wise man with the fool and concludes they both will face the same end. He comes to the realization that even living wisely will not stop him from being placed in a box in the ground just like the village idiot. I've seen a cartoon with two graves, open, open graves, with the dirt on the side waiting for occupants. And one on one grave is a shack, and behind the other grave is a mansion. And we quickly get the idea that we all end up in the same place. In addition to make matters worse, both will long be forgotten. 
These verses are meant to burst all our bubbles and to give us a stark and poignant reality check. All is vanity and a striving after the wind. Chapter 2, verses 18 to 23, contains further reality checks. Verse 18, whatever work, reputation, property, and finances we have gained in this life will go to someone else who may use it wisely or spend it foolishly. This also is vanity. Verses 22, 23, what does one get from all the hard work and efforts of the, in this brief life? For our days are full of sorrow and our labor is hard, often annoying, and a pain in the neck. And even at night, we often toss and turn, worrying about things that happened or might happen at work or at home. This worrying and endless thinking keeps us up at night. Tell me about it. This also is vanity. In the end, achievements and pleasures do not last. Everything is short-lived. Happiness is a vanishing vapor. All our bubbles eventually burst. Throughout this section, Solomon has burst the bubbles of pleasure, profit, materialism, and laughter. The sharpness of death pierces all our pretensions of ultimate and lasting happiness. But now, the preacher does a surprising thing. He bursts death, death's bubble. Solomon's prescription for living the good life doesn't seem like much. Verse 24, there's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. Verse 25, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? Solomon says, eat, drink, and be content with your work because that's all there is. God has given the good things of this world to us and they are our own reward. When it comes to terms with the fact that we are going to die, that reality can stop us expecting too much from all the good things we pursue. We learn to pursue them for what they are in themselves rather than what we need them to be to make us happy. Death reorients us to our limitations as creatures and helps us to see and appreciate God's good gifts every day of our lives. Instead of using these gifts as a mean to greater end of securing ultimate gain in the world, we take the time to live inside the gifts themselves and see the hand of God in them. We need to remember that these are God's blessings to all of us. What if the pleasure of food is a daily joy that we ungratefully overlook? What if our work was never intended to make us successful, but simply to make us faithful and generous? What if it is death that shows us that this is how we are meant to live? One of the striking features of the vast projects undertaken in, chapters, in chapter 2, verses 4 and 9, is how the language evokes the Garden of Eden, as if Solomon was trying to recreate God's good and perfect world. But in reality, it cannot be done. The world in which we live is now fallen and cursed. God has placed a fracture in the fabric of the universe, and things are now not what they should be. Chapter 2, verses 24 to 26, God is finally mentioned in Ecclesiastes. Realizing this can help you deal with life in a way that honors our almighty and sovereign creator. We are to be faithful here on earth, striving to become more like Christ, proclaiming the good news of salvation while we eagerly await the glories of heaven and an eternal communion with God. That's what we should come away with after reading Ecclesiastes. Let me repeat that. We are to be faithful here on earth, striving to become more like Christ, proclaiming the good news of salvation while we eagerly await the glories of heaven and an eternal communion with God. That's where we're going to be happy, not here. But here we have a purpose and we need to pursue it. It is not about our happiness. It's about our holiness. Solomon learns that God is the only one who gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Chapter 2, verse 26. It is so significant that now, at the end of the preacher's epic quest through his life for happiness, he discovers where it comes from. Not from his striving, but from God's giving. God gives these things to the person who pleases him. Solomon's conclusion is found in the last two 
verses of chapter 12, the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. In verse 13, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. Verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40 states, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's it. This is it. Are you doing this? Are we doing this? We are beginning to see the second chapter of Ecclesiastes that we should be deeply committed to a way of being in the world that places us in right relationship to God at a right relationship to all people around us. From these two things flow all the happiness in life we will ever need. For it is there that we see ourselves as we truly are, dependent creatures made for an obedient and loving relationship with our Creator. And I want to leave you with this quote that I've given before because it is, it is so to the point. Charles Thomas Studd, British missionary and evangelist, said it perfectly when he wrote, One life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the life of Solomon, what we can learn from it, the things that are good and the things to avoid. We can learn those from reading the Scripture. The Scripture is the book of knowledge. It tells us everything we need to know. And Father, we thank you for the book of Ecclesiastes and and Father, teach us to number our days and help us to make the most of our time here. That we should never forget that we're here to serve you, to give you all the glory and honor, and to help our fellow man as best as we can, and to share the gospel, the precious gospel, the good news of salvation with those people. Thank you so much for reminding us that over and over again as we read the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.